cool. Um, so thanks for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, what I want to talk about today, I'm going to focus very specifically on how to come up with content ideas. Because my guess is, if you're anything like me and most of the other marketers that I come in contact with, there's a slight bit of overwhelm like you were alluding to. We've got all these platforms. We've got all these channels. We need to be populating them all the time. What are we posting on this platform? How are we going to update our site? We've got to do a blog, now a YouTube video. Now we've got to make TikToks. And it's just sort of this never-ending grind of having to create new content. Uh, and it, it definitely, if you're not trained as a content creator, if this is something that you've sort of taken up this torch as part of your passion, pursuing your business, or if it's been heaped on your plate in addition to the other responsibilities you have, it can feel really overwhelming. Like, what am I going to post today? What else are we going to say? So just a show of hands, how many of you guys are, are feeling that on some level? Like, we've got too much to come up with, and we've got to populate all this stuff, right? So it, it's real. It's real. Um, how many of you would feel the same overwhelm if I asked you, like, could you name 25 human names? Right, like that? that I mean, you'd feel the same overwhelm? You couldn't come up with 20? No, no, it's not your thing. I was like, you, there's, there's people here. Like, <laughs> yeah, 20, 25 human names is a lot easier, right? Or like 25 living things, uh, 25 like items that you can eat, right? These are a lot easier because our brain has a framework. It has a place to go. Right? So if I asked you to name 25 people, what, where would, what would you do first? Or just like three? Uh, who I had to email this morning. Okay, so who you had to email this morning. You could run through that list. Some people might go to, okay, who are uh, members of my, some of my favorite musicians, members of my favorite bands, athletes that I like, uh, people, famous people who have gotten coronavirus, right? Like Tom Hanks, like there we go. So you, know, you can kind of run through these frameworks. Your brain has some sort of guideline of where it's going to go. It creates buckets automatically. And what happens is when we're working with content, we don't have those same buckets. We might have Facebook or Twitter or our blog, but we don't have anything more granular than that. And so we wind up kind of flailing and hoping that something just magically comes to us. Like oftentimes our brainstorm process is kind of sitting down with a notebook or a whiteboard and just like waiting and pondering and like hoping, right? So what I'm going to give you guys today is a system that you can use anytime you need to come up with content ideas. It's going to help you come up with unique content ideas that fit your business purpose. Now, the system I'm going to show you can be used to come up with up to 500 content ideas very easily. And I know you're sitting there like, why, would I, why on earth do I need 500 content ideas? Uh, but if you're doing one piece of content a day, that's only a little over a year, right? So this stuff can be super useful. You don't need to create everything that you come up with, but what it does is give you options so that you can choose. And you never have that feeling of like, oh my god, it's Wednesday. We always post a YouTube video on Wednesday. We've done nothing. We've got to come up with something right now. So this is the only thing you really need to know in order for this system to work, is that a content idea is only two things. It's a focus. What are we focused on? What are we talking about? What's the message, right? What's the focus of our content piece? And it's a format. We're bringing it to life in some way. It's a video or a podcast or a blog post, right? So it's a focus, it's about something, and it's a format. It comes to life in some kind of way. So if we have this as our basis and every piece of content, you know, every piece of content you've created, you mentioned talking about emails this morning, right? So those emails were about something, and they were in the form of, of written content, right? Anybody listen to a podcast recently? Right, so what was the podcast about? Coronavirus. Oh, I mean, okay, yeah, okay. So that was, I, I'm not sure what the particular, probably panic was the focus of that piece of content, uh, but it was in the form of audio, right? Uh, anyone seen a movie recently? Right, so we've got video, right? What, what was the movie that you saw? Uh, last one was Icarus. Icarus, okay, so that was about something, and it was, and it was in the form of video, right? So I've not, I've not heard of that film. But um, so, you know, every piece of content we create or consume fits this kind of mold. So all we need then is sort of a list of focuses that we can use and a list of formats that we can use. And by combining them, we come up with all kinds of unique combinations. So that's really the framework that we're going to build here together today. The one thing I want to focus on, and this is a big mistake that a lot of us make, is we often think format first. Right, we get into a brainstorm, I need something for YouTube, I need a video, I need a new idea for our podcast, we got to put something on the blog. And when we start with the format, the way we're bringing our content to life, the medium that we're choosing, instead of the story that we're telling, we wind up forcing stuff into a format that is not best suited to tell that story. Like, I think we've all had that experience of watching a video and thinking, like, my God, this should have been a blog post. Like, this person did not need to be on.
screen for 30 minutes with a white background just talking at us at like a very close crop, right? Like you, you've had that feeling when you know that something is being presented in the wrong format. Or maybe you're reading an article and it's so dense with data, maybe your coronavirus article, right? Like you're, you're reading something and it's so dense with data you can't wrap your head around it and you think, I wish this had a chart or a graph or something to help me understand what this means, right? So what we want to do is we want to make sure we're focused on our story first. What are we going to talk about? What's the focus? And then we ask, what's the best way to bring that to life? So we're going to talk about the focuses first. So the format of this presentation to help manage your expectations and arrange your note taking uh, is I'm going to walk you through 10 really common focuses that you can use. Some may be familiar to you, and you'll be like, yes, we got that, we do that. Some may be new. I am going to have the slide that has the whole list of 10, so if you miss something, don't panic. Uh, that'll be the good one for you to take a photo of, but I'll walk them through one by one. So we start with people. People is probably the best focus that you can choose for your content. Because when you talk about people, you make your content really relatable. We see ourselves in the content, right? We find similarities in the people who are inside of the content. Obviously, people-focused content could also be about a group of people. So maybe it's a team, a club, an organization of some kind. Anything that's focused on individuals or a group of individuals is your people-focused content. This can work really well for customer stories, right? For employee profiles of some kind. The wonderful thing about doing this is that it doesn't have to just be people within your organization or people who are directly associated with your, your product or your service. By talking to others in the community, any of you who have some sort of podcast where you're interviewing other people, it helps shows your network, it shows your values, it shows the people that you think are important for your audience. So any kind of content focused on people is a really good way to connect. Uh, you can always do interview, um, but I like day in the life too. So think beyond just, we're just gonna interview this person and do Q and A style. What are other ways you could maybe focus on that person's experience? One of the, the best examples of, of people-focused content that surprised me uh, is there was a particular piece that was written around the time that JFK was assassinated, right? So everyone was creating these stories. They're doing profiles of JFK, talking about his family, right? There's a lot that's really taking that particular focus. The piece that won the Pulitzer Prize that year followed the man who dug his grave at Arlington National Cemetery for the entire day to talk about what his experience was like, right? So that piece won the Pulitzer. Of all the coverage of the assassination, that's the one that stood out. So think about how you can talk about people in maybe unexpected ways. Who are the people who don't get the spotlight shown on them that you can kind of bring into the light and introduce your audience to those people? All right, so the next one is basics. Basics is really a form of educational kind of content. This is where we're giving our audience just the basic information that they need about a particular topic. So this kind of content often has headlines or titles like uh, what you need to know about blank but we're afraid to ask. So maybe it's coronavirus. I mean, I don't want to keep talking about the virus because we're going to keep panicking about the virus, right? Or maybe it's CBD or hemp, right? Some of these topics that are kind of, you know, blossoming up in the conversation. Maybe you just want to know a little bit about it. What, uh, what's the deal with, the, with uh, CBD oil and food, right? Just a basic overview of this kind of stuff. Or maybe, you know, someone's buying a bike for the first time. What do I need to know before I buy a bike, right? So, I mean, that might be super, super basic, right? You're, you're thinking that's a huge question. But some people aren't ready for the in-depth yet. They just have basic level questions. And a big part of basics content is helping our potential customers become informed enough that they can become effective customers, right? They often need more information before they can interact with us in a really positive way. So this basic focus content helps get them up to speed so that they can engage with some of our more deep content. All right, the next one is details. So this is sort of the 2.0. We did the basic stuff, the basic overview. Now we've got them a little more educated, or there's some audience members who are already a little further down the education funnel. They better understand our industry, our products. So we want to give them details-focused content that goes a little bit deeper. This is the content that has titles and headlines like everything you wanted to know about blank, but we're afraid to ask, right? It's much more in depth. It tends to be longer. If it's you know written, it's longer in terms of word count. If it's video or audio, it's longer in terms of timestamp. But this is the content that goes all in on a particular subject. So this kind of content is wonderful for SEO value. If you're worried about search, right? Being able to use a lot more keywords and, and touch on a lot of different ways you can talk about a particular topic. So this details focused content that you might create uh, really helps your more advanced audience members learn more about what you do. I want to uh, note here that sometimes the instinct is to talk about a particular product at length, right? I don't necessarily mean that you want to take all your product pages and just make them much longer and more in-depth. This could be answering a question with a very in-depth answer. It could be talking about uh, the entire history of a particular uh, industry or, or product or category of things, right? Just really providing a lot of information about any subject. It doesn't have to just be your product. We'll actually talk about product-focused content in a little bit. 
All right, so the next one, segueing is history. Uh, how many of you guys have a page on your site or, or some element of content that's sort of like our company story, like who we are about us? One of the, the really great opportunities here is to build out some of that content in other places as well. Because just a quick show of hands, how many of you have ever gone to a company history page on purpose? You have, okay. So the, oftentimes, you know, we look at our own stuff, but we sometimes don't exhibit that same behavior when we're engaging with brands ourselves. So sounds like you guys, maybe as part of your studying to, to create your brands, are, are I, I saw the nod, right? It's more like uh, competitive history checking to see what other people's history pages look like. Um, but our customers often don't do that, right? Many times as customers, we're not necessarily interested in the whole history of a company unless it's maybe a company that we know well, that's a local company, or we have some personal connection to. So what we want to do is make sure that that valuable information about our background and history isn't hidden on a sub page of a sub page of our about page, right? So find ways that you could bring that history into your content. Tell, the, tell your founder's story in a form of people-focused content, right? Talk about where you're, you're uh, maybe you had storefronts in the past, but don't anymore, right? Look for those opportunities to look back at your past as an organization and share that with your audience, not just hidden on that about page. All right, so process-focused content. This is some of my favorite stuff. How many of you guys have ever seen a recipe in your Facebook or Instagram feed with hands flying in, uh, mixing things, right? This is probably the most prolific form of process-focused content we have in our current uh, social media environment. Uh, is this recipe or craft videos or also makeup tutorials really big on Instagram, right? This sort of like hands flying in and doing steps in a process. Uh, another great example is a show how it's made. You guys familiar with the show? It's been going for, I believe, 23 seasons. In every single episode, they show you how four different products get made. Like that little segment on Mr. Rogers used to have, too. Like, here's how your crayons get made. Uh, this is really fascinating to people to see the process of how things happen. And a lot of people, you know, I work, I tend to work with a lot of like finance and insurance companies, a lot of heavily regulated industries, and their first response is always, no one cares what we do. They just want it to work, right? But the interesting thing is that we find these things boring because we do them every day. Our audience doesn't, and so they are fascinated. You've probably had this experience, especially if you have young kids or, or nieces or nephews, to see the guy making the pizza or the pretzels, right? Like, that guy doesn't think this is a special skill. He does it all day long, but we can't do it, so it's fascinating, right? Or every time you go to one of those trick basketball games, they always have the guy who's spinning the ball on his finger, which is something he does without even thinking, but we can't do it, so it's really interesting to us. How would you do that, right? So look for those processes. What are those things that you do for your audience without them knowing to help make your product come to life in the background? Show them how that stuff happens, and it can be really interesting for them. And to Tyler's point earlier, don't worry about people stealing. Uh, you know, you're not you're not giving away your secret sauce. You're not saying, here's our proprietary ingredient. You can download that list below. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. We're talking about letting them in, sort of behind the scenes, to see how things happen. It's important to know here that there's two kinds of process-focused content. There's the kind where you actually expect your audience to replicate the process, right? You really want, like, a recipe. This is a, a good. So, have anyone actually made the recipe they saw on their Facebook feed? Right, okay, so this is like aspirational content, right? We're showing people the process, just like on how it's made. I bet most of us have not created, you know, gone and tried to make our own tennis shoes or like a neon sign of our own based on watching that segment. So sometimes it's just informational. We're just watching the process because we're curious and we're going to learn, as opposed to instructional, where we actually want the audience to replicate it. If you're doing instructional content, you want to make sure it's much more detailed so that they can actually follow those steps. So just make sure you make that distinction up front. Is this informational process or instructional where we need to be more detailed so they could follow along? All right, so those are our first five. We've got the next five here. All right, so curation. Curation is really fun. Curation is similar to what you see in like a museum type setting. You're sort of collecting like items and presenting them in some aesthetically pleasing way. Uh, this is the same kind of thing uh, that you that you probably do when you're seeing roundups of some kind. So you see like the 10 podcasts you need to listen to or like 12 books every cyclist should read or you know these kinds of like curated collections of items. One of the great advantages is this is a really good place to start if you feel like you don't have the time, money, or other resources to create a lot of content because you're actually often collecting other people's content. And this is actually still really valuable. Most websites do have a resource page of some kind where it's full of links out. Right? That's still okay. It's still valuable to your audience. Maybe you guys, before coming down here, if you're not local, looked up a list of things to do in Asheville while you were in town. 
right? The person who made that list probably isn't the owner of all those restaurants or all those venues, all those different places they're suggesting, but they still recognize that there's value in providing a collection to your audience. So uh, this kind of content is really good. I want to point out here that it's also really updatable and repeatable. So if you're creating, for example, a list of podcasts or books or events or, or other things, people to follow, right, these kinds of curated lists, you can repeat them again and again, right? So books on different topics, books for different people. And I'm going to give you a little tip at the end for how to multiply any one piece of content into similar pieces of content just like that. The next one is data. So data is a really fun focus for our content. When we focus on data, it just means we're asking, how can we tell the story through numbers? It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to create an entirely custom study or do a focus group or do some you know, insane backed research that has appropriate you know, scientific basis. You know, we're, not, we're not trying to get you to change your career here uh, to, to something with a white lab coat. But the idea is that you're just asking, can this story be told through numbers? So one of the good examples of this, if you think of, uh, if you've been to, uh, you got, many of you guys are in the cycling space. So my guess is you've participated in some sort of large race of some kind. Oftentimes you'll see that kind of roundup content where you see, okay, how many people participated from how many different countries? What was the average performance time at this race? How many medals were given out? How many of those little gummy goo things that people get for energy were given out for free? How many sponsors participated in the event? Uh, how many cups of water were handed out along the side, right? So you think of all those ways that you could approach a story through numbers, and it sometimes just gives you a different perspective on how you might tell the same story. It also, uh, one of the great things is if you are doing some kind of unique thing, if it's your own data or your own numbers that you're compiling and you're not grabbing someone else's data, it also gives you good link back value. If you're the only people who have compiled this data or shared this particular insight, that's, you're the original source. And so the attention and the links, assuming people are ethical and give credit where it's due, will come back to you and your site, which is helpful for a lot of your other marketing metrics too. All right, product focus story. It had to be in here, right? Because at the end of the day, we are trying to sell something. And it is important for us to focus on our product at some point. So it's why it's part of this list. Um, you know, my background is as a journalist. And so I have had people say before, well, like, of course you don't want us to talk about our product. You just want us to be all about storytelling and like feeling good and narratives. But like, no, we are here to sell something, right? That is generally our business objective. And coming back to Tyler's point, you need to understand your why. And many times the why for the particular content pieces we're creating is I need to sell sell something, or I need to convert, I need to sell tickets, I need to drive downloads, I need to drive signups, whatever that case may be, you need to create some product focused content. Obviously, this is really important, you know, just something to note that this should be part of your mix, right? And so all if all currently, if all the content you're creating is product focused content, then hopefully this has kind of opened your eyes to some other ways you may tell stories about your business, your employees, your values as a company. If you're not doing any of this, it's probably contributing to why you may not be uh, seeing the kind of conversions you hope for. I also want to point out that this kind of product-focused content doesn't have to be dry product descriptions. One of my favorite, favorite series uh, of product-focused content is a series on YouTube called Will It Blend? You guys heard of this? Okay, so I don't know if, if many of you are aware, Blend Tech, the company who makes those blenders, created that series. Not some fun YouTuber who thought it's going to be cool to throw stuff in a blender. There's a similar series about can you microwave this? That's just someone who had a cool idea to microwave stuff and see what happens. But Blendtec created the Will It Blend series. So this is product focused content in the form of video where they're showing how powerful their product is by doing something fun and entertaining, by throwing golf balls and iPhones and all kinds of fun stuff into a blender to see will it blend. So don't feel like your product focused content has to just be a product description or here's how it works, right? Think about some of those ways you could show instead of tell your audience how those products work. All right, our second to last focus that you can try is an example. So what I mean by this is sometimes it's helpful instead of, again, telling our audience how something works or what they can do with it or the effects they might see, to show them instead by doing a case study, by finding an example of the thing we're trying to get them to understand and telling that story instead. Right? So that's one of the, the ways you can still do this is, is kind of prove the value of a product. Right? The other great thing about this is it allows you to quote either your clients, your customers, you know, find that person who loves your product, who's an advocate, who's seen the benefits that you promise, and talk to them at length. Let them say it. It's always better to get an endorsement from someone else than to have to say it yourself. Our product is great. We promise you'll love it. It's going to create awesome benefits for you. Having someone else say it, it's the reason we all check the reviews on products. Even we, We'd rather trust a stranger 
on the internet than the company that's selling us a product, right? So how can we find ways to, to find those people who serve as an example of the promises we make and let them tell that story instead? All right, and the last focus you should consider is opinion. So many times we're trying to be very objective with our content. This is especially true in journalism, my background. Um, but it is actually incredibly valuable sometimes to have an opinion. So you know, you think about, I made the example before of things to do in Asheville. Um, would you prefer to have a curated list of here are the 15 best things to do in Asheville, or here's an exhaustive list of everything that can be done in Asheville? Right, the curated list, the, the one where someone has expressed an opinion and used some judgment in selecting those items is much more valuable to you as a consumer. And so the same is true for your audience, right? Sharing your opinion could be as simple as saying favorites or our staff picks. Uh, I went to the, the bookstore down the street over here and they had a whole aisle that was staff curated picks. Here's our, our favorites. So not just here's all the books in our store, but here's what Emily thinks you should read and here's what Carl thinks you should read and here's what Adam thinks you should read, right? So finding ways to bring opinion, even in those slight ways to show some judgment, some selection, some preference, uh, really helps your audience see that there's some value you in what they're creating. This is one of the reasons that those of us in journalism like to hope that we'll still be around as this like democratization of content is around, is that people like the editorial judgment of knowing someone chose which stories are on the front page. Someone's helping me cut through the noise and see what's most important. So you can use that same power to say, I've helped you cut through the noise and choose the top things. These are our favorites. We're using our judgment to help you see what's most important. All right, so there's that photo slide. Here's those 10 focuses that you should consider, 10 focuses that you can consider when you're trying to figure out what should I create content about, what can I say, what's the story here. All this makes sense? Cool. All right, so that's going to go across the top of like our matrix here. So imagine, and I'll show you again at the end, you've got those focuses are across the top here. You don't have to be super, uh, you know, Nostradamus here to see that we are going to fill in the other side here with those focuses and you end up with a hundred possible combinations for any story that you want to tell. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to go through, we did the focuses, now let's go through 10 formats. And this is going to go a little faster because as consumers, we are actually a lot more familiar with the formats. It's much easier to see and feel and experience. So this should be a lot easier. So writing, this is the, the, most obvious one. Most of us have had to create written content in some form, right? Uh, you were writing emails just this morning. You're writing notes right now. You've probably texted someone since you got in here. You filled in the Wi-Fi password, right? We're, we're very used to written content. The big advantage of written content is, again, most of us can create it. It requires very minimal resources to create and produce. It's inexpensive. It's fast to produce. Uh, and again, that, that is generally the challenge that most of us are facing is having enough time and resources to create. So written content is first because it's generally our go-to. Infographics. Infographics are a lot of fun because they make our content visual. So again, I gave the example before, particularly in this panic right now, there's a lot of talk uh, about the, the, the virus and the rate at which it spreads. I think one of the things that I've seen shared more in the last 24 hours is a particular chart that shows the impact of social distancing. Right, so it's showing that, that sharp rise that happens if we continue to you know, have the NBA finals with thousands of people packed into a place, right? Uh, versus having people you know, spend more time solo. So that graph helps people see something in a way that they couldn't understand when it was just words. The difference between you probably shouldn't uh, go to a stadium full of people and this is the impact if you do that visually helps people understand it in a different way. So looking for ways where you could illustrate your data, illustrate information, uh, the one thing here is that obviously it requires some sort of data to illustrate. Um, there are other types of graphics you can create. You can create quote graphics and things like that um, that don't necessarily require data. But if you do have numbers, seeing if there's a way you can illustrate it. The other thing I want to point out is that obviously we're all somewhat beholden to our algorithmic overlords and they tend to, uh, they tend to prefer more visual and interactive content. So by adding some sort of graphic visual element to other types of content, you can help make that a little bit more shareable. If you are making a lot of infographics, you probably have noticed are, are sort of long. They're like very tall. They look like, you know, skyscraper icons or something. Um, if you do that, the other thing that's great about that is you can cut it up and repurpose it. Each individual section or stat can be turned into a social graphic. So that's another way to get better return on your time, right? You create one big infographic and chop it up to become a lot of different posts. All right, so next is audio. You guys are probably familiar. Many of you are probably listening to, to audiobooks or podcasts and things. 
the one thing I want to point out here is that I think there's actually a big, big missed opportunity in content that is not actually a series or an interview, but environmental sounds. So one of the things I noticed is a minute or two ago, there were a number of uh, fire engines or some sort of sirens outside, and everyone was sort of tuned in. You couldn't help but sort of, you couldn't help but hear it right outside. That sound and the sounds that we experience throughout our lives are very important. They kind of set the scene, right? You can think of maybe the sound of, the sound of a basketball game. You can hear it in your head, right? The crowd, the buzzer. Talk about the sounds of walking through nature on a quiet morning, right? That sets a scene. Hearing something is so, so much more powerful than just reading about it. So think about ways you can include environmental sound. Maybe it's just, hear, like, what were we hearing? What did it sound like, right? So think about opportunities you might be able to bring some environmental sound just to let people hear what you're otherwise just going to describe or try to show with a picture. Next is video. Video is very familiar. I don't have to tell you what video is. We experience video all the time. It's obviously seen a very sharp rise in the last few, uh, last few years. It does allow you to transport your audience. And again, prioritized by social, you know, video content is often you know, seeing a higher distribution rate than some of our plain text or link-based posts. So having that video is really helpful. Um, this is, it can be a challenge for some people. I know that some folks feel like, well, I'm not a video producer. I don't know how to edit video. It's not my strong suit. That's not my background. Important to know that there are a lot of really good tools out there that can help you kind of create simple videos using only text and B-roll. Um, so Wibbitz, W-I-B-B-I-T-Z is one of those. There are others that are very similar. It's almost like creating a slideshow where you just sort of use the, you've seen these probably on social media a lot where it's sort of B-roll or images with text that pops up on the bottom, right? So that's a good way for you to experiment with that without having to, you know, go and get a, a degree in, in, you know, film production. Um, the other thing to consider, I always encourage people, is that you probably have a local university that has a communications, journalism, or similar program full of students who need projects for their portfolio, who are learning the latest tools, who have access to the latest tools and software so they don't have to charge you for it, and who are really willing to learn and experiment. So I always encourage people, if this is something you want to be doing and you don't currently have the resources, find an intern, find a local student you can pay uh, a very reasonable rate so that they get something for their portfolio and you get some cool content. Uh, with you know minimal uh, pain for your budget point. All right, and live video. I have live video here separate because I do want us to think about them separately. Live video is not simply a regular video that you happen to be streaming live, but you often want to have a different strategy for what it is that you're sharing and approach it in a different way. So we've got live here separately. I uh, do want to point out that some, some people are kind of intimidated by live because it feels like it's too crazy, there's too many variables, anything could happen. Um, I don't know if you guys saw recently, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago, somebody went viral. There was a, a reporter who was doing a live shot. I see you smirking. He was doing a live shot from like a, uh, it was it here? He, so he was doing this live shot during a storm and he hap or during traffic or something, and he happened to have accidentally hit a filter button. So he, it was cycling through while he's doing his live report of like, he has a space helmet on, he has bunny ears on, he has a dog tongue hang, like cycling through these filters during his live report, right? I get it. Live can be scary. But the other thing is, I don't know that any other reporter, you know, local media reporter has gotten that kind of play or publicity in the last little bit. So it can be kind of fun too, right? Um, but the other thing is, it's, it's also more casual. There's more forgiveness when you're doing live because your audience understands that anything can happen. If you went into a feature length film at the movie theater and there were issues and errors and you, you expect a higher level of production from produced video than you do in live video. There's more understanding. So just you know, keep that in mind. Your audience has an expectation that this is happening live and anything can happen. So it's a little bit, a little bit more forgiving. Don't be so intimidated. All right, our last five here in image gallery. So uh, oftentimes we, we think of images as a single thing. I'm just going to throw an image at the top of the video or you know, a, a, a thumbnail. I need to put something at the, the top of a, a blog post or something just so we have a thumbnail of some kind. But consider the power of multiple images together, right? How can you paint a bigger picture? This could be as simple as you know, doing an Instagram carousel where you post you know, multiple images that people can swipe through. Um, one of the great advantages of this, and people often overlook this, is the possibility to have those images actually be part of a longer image. So imagine it's a panoramic view of our amazing view up here that people can swipe through and see one by one. It keeps people engaged on what would otherwise be a single image. So there's a lot of creative ways you can turn a single image into a gallery and have it still be useful for your audience. This also includes things like um, uh, 
collages and things. You'll often see some of your friends probably do this. There was a, an event and they put four or five of their favorite photos in sort of a, a collage, so those work well. And this actually works really well in print. So this is uh, in my newspaper days when we had to fill pages, maybe an ad dropped or a story didn't happen and now we have two blank pages. Our favorite thing to do was just, well, let's just, we'll just do a collage. Like here's 15 photos from the school board meeting last night. No one wants to look at it, but it's going to fill the two pages for us, right? So these kind of uh, collages of multiple images that are related are, are really, really helpful. So, Okay, a timeline. Timeline, now we're getting into the ones where you probably are a little less familiar, maybe haven't created this stuff. Timelines are really, really fun. It's a really great way to plot your content on a, in a chronological way. It allows you to kind of look at content that's happening over time. Many of the stories that we tell have some sort of chronological element, and we're sort of relying on our audience to remember all the dates and all the happenings, put them in the correct order, and understand what those relationships are to one another. Whereas if we plotted it visually on a timeline, it really allows them to, to better see the point of what we're trying to do. Uh, how many of you guys, the like true crime genre of documentaries and short series on Netflix, right? There's always a timeline. They always have the timeline. They're like, here's when the body was discovered, and here's when this guy was brought in for questioning, but whoa, back it up. He lived right here, right next door that week, right? So they kind of show you how all those events relate to one another and help you understand the relationships between those points in time. So this can work really well for your that history or about page we were talking about. could work well for the development of a product, for the growth of a company for the planning of an event, right? You could release a timeline showing all the different points and how we all ended up here today. Uh, so look for ways you can use timelines to visually show points in time. Quiz. Quiz is another one that I think is kind of underutilized. One of the, the things that can be very intimidating for our customers especially is trying to figure out what product is right for them. Um, being able to help them do that through some sort of quiz is often a much easier and less intimidating way for them to figure out what might be a good fit. The other thing that can be fun about this is sort of like a, a personality style quiz where there's not a right or a wrong answer, but it's putting people into buckets. Um, so anyone in here taking the Myers-Briggs type indicator, right? Okay, so that's a personality style quiz. You answer a series of questions and it tells you like, I'm an INTJ. Anyone, what are you? You're, what? Yes. Oh, guys, INTJs are very rare. This never happens. <laughs> But the cool thing about when you create these kind of personality quizzes is you create a sense of identity, right? I mean, we just had, we had a moment where INTJs, like twinsies, right? So you create this sense of, of self-identifying in your audience that lets them see their similarities and differences. Adobe did this recently with uh, what type of creative are you? So they had a quiz that let you say, okay, I'm the innovator or I'm the disruptor, right? So you kind of create this sense of identity. And when people do that, they have pride and they go around. I mean, Myers-Briggs doesn't have to advertise that they have this type, this personality quiz because people identify, they connect, they recommend, and then you feel left out. And some of you are probably like, dang it, I got to go take the Myers-Briggs type uh, and figure out which one I am, right? So you can create that same feeling of identity with a personality style quiz for your audience. All right, so a tool. One of the things that uh, is really helpful for your audience is uh, uh, just to differentiate quickly between a quiz and a tool. So a quiz, again, is more, more fun. It's scored. There's a limited set of outputs, right? The Myers-Briggs only has so many different outcomes for which personality you are. You know, if you're doing a product quiz, which one is right for you? There's only so many outputs. A tool has, in many ways, unlimited outputs. So you've probably all used some sort of character counter tool to make sure that a piece of text isn't too long for a field in a form somewhere, right? The number of outputs, I mean, surely there's some tech limitation on how much text you could paste in there, but it's a custom output based on your input. Uh, so this is, a tool is really designed to help your audience accomplish something without you having to determine what those out, outputs could be. So another good example of this is uh, last week when I was out in, uh, in San Diego for Social Media Marketing World, uh, I broke a nail when I was like taking my uh, my bag out of the out of the car, and I went to the salon and said, "Like, could you fix this? Like, I have to go on stage tomorrow. I don't want it to look bad." And they had a different brand of nail polish. I know, guys, you're like, "This means nothing to me," but this is very important. It's like trying to match two different products that have two different color schemes, right? Um, so I, the lady was like, "This one's probably right," and she did it. And then, it, guys, it was not right. It was like all of the nails were red, and one was bright purple. Like, it looked so bad. But I desperately was googling like why haven't these brands created a oh you're used to being a se customer and you're used to wearing color number one four five well now that you're our customer you should be using color eight seven b 
right? Some sort of tool that translates between the two things. You've probably similarly used language translating tools, or this was a recipe for three people, now I need it to be a recipe for seven people, right? What are the opportunities where your audience is creating some sort of calculation or trying to, to translate between things that you could create a tool that makes that process easier, make it easier for them to become your customer, to switch, to make a translation or make a change that they need to, to be your customer. All right, and the last one is a map. So we're familiar with maps again in our true crime drama. There's always the, here's where the evidence was found, and here's where this guy was arrested, and here's where this person lived suspiciously close to where the crime happened, right? So maps are really good. Obviously, I think for those of you in the cycling space, you, you are probably a little more easily able to create maps than some of us who, who are in a, in a different space. Uh, this is something I've seen work really well with a local running store. Uh, they actually have a recurring series where they create ma local maps with running routes of different lengths. So then on their website, you could sort through and see, I want a local one mile run, a three mile run, a five mile, a 10 mile, 25, et cetera, with all different maps, different routes around town, right? So that's one option if you're giving people routes. You can also show, we've all probably looked up a, I'm looking for a something or other store near me. Uh, I need an office depot or I need a grocery store or something and they have the map that shows where the different locations are. Uh, in New York, we do the, the Starbucks near me. There's, there's always one within like, you know, you can see one from any point. Uh, so, you know, those kinds of location maps, if that's relevant for you, are helpful too. Um, but there are a lot of ways, anytime you're telling a story with a geographic element where you're telling people where things happen, there's an opportunity to create even a very simple map that helps them plot those things in different places. All right, so here's that other one. Here's that recap. Make sure you got all 10 of those. So these are those 10 formats, writing, infographic, audio, video, live video, image galleries, timelines, quizzes, tools, and maps. So those, as we said, are going to go down the other side. We have our focuses and our formats. Uh, all of these, I know a lot of these are really familiar, and you're like, yes, I got it, writing, I've heard of that before. Um, but I think the power of this is when you combine them together. So this is the full one here. So we've got people, basics, details, history. Those are all of our focuses across the top. You've got all of your formats down the side, and you can see there's 100 possible intersections here. So if you guys are coming out with a new product or you have a, a big holiday coming up that you want to create content around or you're opening a new location, you're driving initiative, some sort of initiative you want to drive engagement with, there's a hundred different ways you can tell that story. And they're all familiar to you. And if you're sitting there thinking, okay, well, you know, we can't necessarily do opinion because we have some company policy or we don't have the resources to build a tool right now, that's fine. Shorten it up. You've still got 70, 80, 50, 20 even ways you can tell that story. And the idea isn't that you should create 20, 50, 100 pieces of content about the same thing. You don't have time for that. Your audience doesn't have time for that. But this makes it so that you're not staring at a blank page. You've got a place to start and you could figure out what's going to be best for what you want to do. So say you've gone through that process, you, you looked at the different options and you said, okay, I want to tell this type of story. I want to do a curated list of products every cyclist needs before a major race, right? I'm going to do that curated list. I know it works. So you create that and it works well and you want to capitalize on it. So how do I kind of multiply it? How do I take something that I know is going to work that I'm going to create and create even more content? These are sort of like the silver bullet. These are the multipliers. So there's four of them here. And these are all covered in the book too, by the way. So if you want more information about all these, it's, it's all there in the book. Um, multiplying your content by time. So maybe you did, uh, this is the 15 things every cyclist needs for a fall race, for a winter race, for a summer race, for a spring race. Maybe there's not that much difference between those things. I'm not a cyclist. I'm deeply sorry if that was a horrible example. Um, but, you know, <laughs> multiplying by different time periods uh, is one of the options that can work really, really well. Um, by different, you know, hour, day, you know, maybe there's different things you need if it's a, 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 a short race or a long race, right? Um, by different years. So maybe you want to update this. This is the best products for every cyclist of 2020, of 2019, 2018, et cetera. So give them these, these different, you know, repeat that same piece of content with different time periods. So the next one is demographic. Uh, the thing, the demographic here we're talking about for different races, ethnicity, profession, age, gender, et cetera, right? So for a different subset of your audience. The important thing I want to mention here is we don't want to pander to our audience and create, you know, pieces of content just to, just for the sake of creating pieces of content for different subsets. It's only when doing so would actually be helpful or actually be necessary. So for our, our cycling products you need or, or equipment you need, maybe there is genuinely a difference between what a beginner cyclist or an experienced cyclist would need, right? 
we don't want to say what women cyclists and male cyclists and 18-year-old cyclists and 27-year-old cyclists just for the sake of it, right? But if there is a substantial difference in that equipment or in those recommendations based on some of these factors, then we do want to make sure we're addressing that and we can multiply that successful piece of content into additional pieces. So the next one would be location. So it could be something like your country, region, city, part of town, et cetera. Um, but I also want to note that it's not just geographic. So um, one of the examples here, if you were doing like how to store your bike, uh, how to store your bike in a garage, how to store your bike in a small apartment, how to store your bike outdoors, right? So you can look at location, not just as places on a map. Uh, you know, if you're talking about biking injuries, okay, injuries to the knee, to the hip, to the back, to the elbow, uh, to the hand. I saw your, your hand. You doing okay? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> so looking at those, at those injuries in different parts of the body, right? Location can mean a lot of different things depending on the particular type of content piece that we're creating. And the last one would be resources. So this would work particularly well when you want to talk about, okay, here's the pieces of equipment under $100, under $500, under $1,000, right? Between this, this certain range. Uh, we see this oftentimes uh, when we're talking about products and services is sort of budget gaps to, to create lists depending on what someone's budget might be. Um, but oftentimes we also see it based on ingredients. So um, I, I have this experience a lot. I have a very small kitchen and so a lot of times I look up a recipe and I'm really excited to make something and then I'm like, do you see room for a hand mixer in this kitchen? Like I can't use this recipe now. I don't have the right equipment, right? Or if you're doing any sort of repair on your home, you're like, well, I don't have a belt sander. So obviously I can't, you know, do this particular DIY project. And then you've got to look up an adapted version with or without a particular ingredient. Same thing for any of you who have allergies or dietary restrictions. Now you've got to look up something without meat or without soy, et cetera. So thinking about you know, tools, investment, cost, or maybe the number of people you need. You know, this is a project that can be done, but only if you have a second person or you need three people, or this is a solution for five-person teams versus three-person teams. So thinking about all these ways, anytime you have a piece of content that's working, asking how can I multiply it? Are there ways for me to take what's working and create more pieces of content that are working, right? One good idea and turn it into many. So then your graph looks kind of like this. Instead of having one idea in every single intersection, you've multiplied this one by time, and this one by demographic, and this one by location, right? And now, from that very same set of focuses that you understand and know well, formats that you understand and know well, and a few simple multipliers like time and people and location, right? You're able to create 300 ideas or 500 ideas. Right? So it becomes very, very easy and you're not looking at a blank page. You don't have to sit there and say, what are we going to post today? Because now you have a system, right? Now you have a, a, a framework for how to look at it to say, what is our focus on this piece of content? What is our format? And when it works, how can we multiply it to make it work even better? So this is the system that I talk about in the book. You guys all got a copy of it today. If you didn't, there's more up front. Let us know. Um, in the book, I walk through all the focuses, all the formats. There's additional formats in there. I go in deep on the multipliers. And there are literally hundreds of tangible examples of what every single one of these intersections could be for all different types of businesses. My hope is that all of you guys walk out of here feeling like you are storytellers. You are content creators. You can come up with an unlimited number of content ideas to serve all the platforms and channels that you need. But if you have questions, or you feel stuck, or you need more information, you can definitely reach out to me. I would be happy to help, happy to answer any questions, point you in direction of resources or tools or things that may be helpful for you. Um, one of the other things I hear oftentimes is, well, I don't know how to make a blank, quiz, tool, whatever the case may be. Uh, every single chapter also has a link to a web page with resources. So that could be tools, helpful information, examples, and other stuff. So really, really, uh, for me, I love storytelling. Like coming from journalism, uh, the thing I always say is you never see a newspaper not come out because we couldn't think of anything to say. So uh, you know, coming up with ideas on deadline is our specialty. And I've seen the power that really incredible stories can have on people, on communities, on whole nations and ways of thinking. And so I want you to be able to harness that for yourselves, trying to make it as easy as possible for you to do that. So hopefully this will be a good resource for you. And hopefully you guys can all walk out of here feeling like you've got the power of story in the palm of your hand too. Thanks.